Who will rescue me from this body that is doomed to die? Thank God, Jesus Christ will res rescue me. So with my mind, I serve the law of God, although my selfish desires make me serve the law of sin. And then we also have Romans 8, 1 through 6, also in the contemporary English version. If you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. The Holy Spirit will give you life that comes from Christ Jesus and will set you for free from sin and death. The law of Moses cannot do this because our selfish de desires makes the law weak. But God set you free when he sent his own son to be like us sinners and to be a sacrifice for our sin. God used Christ's body to condemn sin. He did this so that we would do what the law commands by obeying the spirit instead of our own desires. People who are ruled by the desires think only of themselves. Everyone who is ruled by the Holy Spirit thinks about spiritual things. If our minds are ruled by our desires, we will die. But if our minds are ruled by the Spirit, we will have life and peace. And as Merrill would say, so be it. So do you ever feel like Paul? Do you get frustrated sometimes because you want to do what's right, but you continue to do what's wrong? I feel that way all the time. It's just another day that ends in Y, right? But see, we don't have to feel that way. And the biggest thing that sets us apart from any other faith, any other religion or anything, is the fact that the Holy Spirit... God Himself dwells inside of us. If you've been reading along in the Old Testament, you've seen that the law can't save you. The law just points to the fact that you are a sinner and you need a Savior. Praise be to God that He would send His Son, Jesus Christ. Whew. So let's start with prayer. Father in Heaven, we do thank You so much that You are a gracious, loving God. We thank you that your precepts are true. We thank you that you are full of justice, just as well as you are full of love and mercy and grace. We long for the day when Christ returns. We thank you for the Savior that you've sent. We thank you for the Spirit that indwells us and gives us the power to become more and more like Christ on this earth. May we not waste our life. May we, instead of leaning to our own desires, may we pray that your will be done and your kingdom come. Use us, Lord, as you fill us with your Spirit and change us to be more like Christ. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So are you keeping up with your reading? Are you? Mm, should I make you raise your hands up and see and point you out? <laughs> well, thank you for the ones that are. You've got into that section now where you're like, okay, what am I reading now? I got all these laws I don't understand and they're repeating more and more and uh, this is the point where I usually kind of lose it. <laughs> I'll be honest. So now I'm telling you guys, sharpen iron. Ask me if I am, I'll ask you if you are and I think I'm caught up with today's even because I woke up this morning an hour early and I'm like, okay Lord, did you want me to read today's? What, what's going on? And so I just gave in to His will and read. But we read all these things and we wonder, why, why is Aaron taking blood and splattering it here and he putting it on his ears and on his big thumb and his, on his toe? That is kind of but then when you think about it <laughs> and you sit there and say, what in the world? That's kind of like with, with Rose. She, she just put her foot in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> she understands about canning and stuff. Okay? You ask William about canning. I get to pick on you, William, because I love you. You ask William about canning, and he says you go to the grocery store to the aisle that says canned goods. But Rose knows that she has to plant a garden, that that season comes one time of year. She knows she has to fertilize the garden, put work into it, take out weeds, and then she gets ready to can the goods, which are in jars, actually. And who knows, you know, okay, neither that we won't chase that rabbit. Cause, yeah, because that's not a can, right? <laughs> and she understands she has to do all these things when... We, younger generation, I remember it a little bit, but go further than that, they don't understand that at all because that's foreign to them. 
So as we're reading these things, take that into mind, and what we're reading is foreign to us because we don't understand all those things. And you might consult a, a Jew that's strong in the Torah and all these different things, and, and maybe they understand better. But the difference is, is those things aren't common to us. But in that day, it was common. They sacrificed to God. They knew that blood had to be shed. And all that points that Jesus was our ultimate sacrifice, our ultimate high priest, that His blood had to be shed so that we could become the righteousness of God. So when I'm thinking about it, I'm reading this, and it sounds crazy, then I think of the monkeys that hear no evil, see, oh, maybe the things that I listen to, my ear has been sanctified and made holy. Maybe the things I do with my hand, I ought to consider that God gave me those hands to work and honor Him. And wherever I go, and you can't hardly walk without a big toe if you hadn't thought about it. It's what makes you balance. Maybe the places that I go, I ought to think first where I'm going or anything. And then you might understand a little bit more about why God commanded them to destroy the pagans, to take those temptations away from, him, from them so that they wouldn't turn to idols, to pagan gods, but instead would worship the Lord their God with all of their heart all of their soul, all of their mind, all of their body, all of their strength. And, as Jesus says, to love one another. Because we see so much of that. Then we see all those rules. rules. If your neighbor, if your neighbor's ox, all this, and it makes a little more sense. Even though it's still kind of difficult for us because we're not used to the things of those days. So, I encourage you, keep reading. Read with that aspect and know that your brothers and sisters in Christ are reading right along with you, and it's wonderful. So today's sermon I entitled, The Love That God's Spirit Gives You. Did you listen to those verses? Because see what happens when we continue to do the wrong things, which we're going to continue to do, hopefully less and less as we become more and more like Christ. The answer is Jesus Christ. Because He died, He is the way, the truth, and the life. And He said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will ask the Father to send the Spirit. If you think about back to those Old Testament times, it'll make a little more sense then. All that ritual that we went through to, to consecrate and make holy Aaron so he could go into the temple before God, <laughs> you've already been consecrated and made holy. The Holy Spirit seals you as God's only child. When Jesus died, the veil, the temple curtain was torn. We have access to God, not as a nation, but God as an individual parent. He is our Father. That we can cry, Abba, which is the common word for Daddy. We have a Daddy in heaven that loves us so much that He would give His one and only Son to die for us. So He provides the way of escape. The way of escape from death, from the penalty of sin, but also the power of sin because He sends His Holy Spirit to live in us. He doesn't expect us to just go on then and start living a right life. He knows that we cannot do what's right. What a wretched, pitiful man I am, but if I live by the power of the Spirit, and for me to die is for Him to live, for me to become less, as John the Baptist says, is for Jesus to increase then the more and more that I am going to live a life that brings glory and honor to God, the more that sin is going to come more foreign and foreign to me where I don't have those desires of the flesh like I used to. To one day we're in heaven and we don't have those desires at all. We're in a perfect place for all eternity. Wow. So we've been reading from Colossians 1. I want to read from the contemporary English version today. I'm introducing some different translations for you just so you can see them, and you read whatever speaks to you. Okay? Contemporary English version, Colossians 1, 1 through 11, says this, From Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from Timothy, who is also a follower, to God's people who live in Colossae and, and are faithful followers of Christ, I pray that God our Father will be kind to you and will bless you with peace. Each time we pray for you, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ and your love for all of God's people. 
Because what you hope for is kept safe for you in heaven. You first heard about this hope when you believed in the true message, which is the good news. The, the good news is spread all over the world with great success. It has spread in the, in the same way among you, ever since the first day you learned the truth about God's wonderful kindness. From our good friend Epaphras, he works together with us for Christ and is a faithful worker for you. He is also the one who told us about the love that God's Spirit has given you. We have not stopped praying for you since the first day we heard about you. In fact, we always pray that God will show you everything that He wants you to do, and that you may have all the wisdom and understanding that His Spirit gives you. Then you will live a life that honors the Lord, and you will always please Him by doing good deeds. You will come to know God even better. His glorious power, that power from on high, the Spirit that lives inside of you, will make you patient and strong enough to endure anything, and you will be truly happy. Do you see how Paul's words go right here to the words that he wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 7 and chapter 8? Do you see what God is trying to do with the Israelites back in Exodus? But they are a, a stiff-necked people. Maybe that's the words that you read as you were reading that. They were stubborn, rebellious. They wanted their will over God's will. They wanted to sit on the throne of their own lives rather than God sitting on the throne. Paul is writing this letter, remember, while he's in prison and he's facing immediate death. But he's very content and he's writing these words of encouragement and he's heard about this church that has their faith grounded in Jesus Christ and has love for one another in the brotherhood, for fellow Christians. But yet they're facing persecution. People are telling them that their faith is all wrong, that there's, there's a new way, that Jesus just attained salvation, that wisdom is still the way to go. And he writes this letter to encourage them and let them know that what they're doing is what they should be doing. Their faith is grounded in Jesus Christ. Their love is growing. People are hearing about the gospel message and seeing a difference in their lives. We know the song, we'll know them, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. See, we should love so offensively, so radically, that people say, what in the world happened to that person? Why are they different? Why do they stand out from the rest of the world? What is this thing about this Jesus that they proclaim? Because if we just proclaim to know Jesus and we don't stand out that way, then we look like the rest of the world. Huh. We're brought back to the times in the pagan lands in, in Israel, aren't we? Exactly the same thing. Our lives need to be holy, consecrated, set apart for God. And we have the Spirit living inside of each and every one of us. Tying us together, giving us gifts so that we can build up the body, so that each of us are inspired and spurred, as we read in Hebrews, to do good works so that others will know God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God is a big, big God with a big, big plan, and it's a perfect plan. When you were reading Job, what did you think about Job? You saw all this cosmic battle going on, and maybe now as you're reading further, you can see that that story probably did come first. That we see this cosmic battle going on of spiritual forces, and mankind is what all of creation is watching. To see how God is going to use this stiff-necked people these people who are so selfish, instead of loving selflessly, how is God going to use us? Praise be to God that He would give us His Son to provide us the way. And don't forget, give us His Spirit to help us live the way. So that we can bring glory and honor to God. Do you believe God is that big? Do you believe He's that sovereign? I was watching some stuff on string theory this week, and I don't know what I was watching. I don't even comprehend it. And about the fact that now scientists think there are at least 10 or 11 different dimensions. I'm sorry, I get stuck at four. Four I can comprehend, because we've, we've got everything that we see now. And think of it this way, TV's two-dimensional. This is three-dimensional, okay? A fixed point is one-dimensional. Fourth dimension means I can travel along through this, in time. Oh, yeah, I can see that God can do that. 
Scientists believe that. They believe there's a fourth dimension. They believe there's a fifth dimension, sixth dimension, possibly 11 dimensions with alternate universes and all this. Oh, wait a minute. What they're describing is the God of the Bible, is it not? But they want to call it something else. If you're reading through, he said, I'm going to do this to bring about my glory and honor, and Pharaoh will not obey. How did God know that except that He's sovereign in total control of all things? And He placed you in this church today, in this community, at your job, everything about you so that you could bring glory and honor to Him. I hope you're seeing that from the Bible. Many say that Job is just a, is just a story because it's written in poetry and, and things. People say, it was just a story. That didn't exist. And you know why it didn't exist? Because it talks about dinosaurs. We all know from science today that dinosaurs lived millions of years before mankind, right? Really? I heard a thing this week that in some of the tombs they discovered a picture of what looks like a woolly mammoth with the Egyptians carrying these huge tusks of ivory. But woolly mammoths didn't live then, right? Uh-huh. Go over into Montana, just next to us, and look and see footprints of human beings beside dinosaurs. You know why those footprints were there? Because man and uh, dinosaur were going to higher elevation, trying to escape a worldwide flood that a lot of people don't want to believe in. But in Job, it describes what we call a brontosaurus, because it has a tail of a cedar, cedar tree. That's huge. And yet in some of your Bibles, if you looked at footnotes that were there, it said probably a hippopotamus. Have you seen a hippopotamus's tail? Google hippopotamus. They're big everywhere so you don't see their little curly Q tail like a pig. That's not what my Bible describes. So be careful what you read from the commentaries and stuff. The reason that Job describes a dinosaur is because Job was familiar with that dinosaur. And God says, you see this magnificent beast over here? I made him. I feed him. Everything else. Did, were you there? So that we can see that there is a God who deserves our worship. But He's given us a choice whether we're going to worship Him or not. That's the difference. And once we decide to accept the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, then He gives us His Spirit so that we can live the life that we could never live otherwise. We look back at the Israelites and say, how could they have done it? How could they have been led out of the wilderness? You just should have got to the golden calf yesterday. And Aaron, of all people, built a golden calf because Moses, this fellow, as yours might say, they don't know where he's at because he's been up for three weeks now or four weeks now, however long it's been. And they don't know if he's coming back. So they build a idol, which God has told them not to, and they build an altar and bow down and worship it. How could they do such things? How can we do a lot of the things we do when we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. When Peter says we are priests, a royal priesthood. So I don't want to point fingers and condemn because anytime I point, I've got all the others pointing back at me. Instead, I want to say as David said, against you, Lord, have I sinned. Please forgive me. Search my heart. Examine me so that I won't sin against you. And God called him a man after his own heart the one who committed atrocious sins compared to the world. But yet God said, this is a man after my own heart. So do you believe God is that big? Do you believe Job is a real story? <laughs> do you believe the words written in the Old Testament and the New Testament? Job 22, verse 15 and 16 says this. I'm going to review a little bit more to show you that, that Job is history. It says, will you keep... To the old path that the wicked have trod. They were carried off before their time. Their foundations washed away by what? Ah, there we've got a time period. Job lived after what? The flood. 
Hmm. All right, let's look deeper. Job, let's go back to Job chapter 1, verse 1. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. So he's lived a long enough life that he's had seven sons and three daughters, right? Verse 3. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among the people of the East. Hmm, comparing him to what was familiar in the time of Abraham who owned flocks like this and everything after the flood again. Verse 4, his sons used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthday, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had to run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Back to what was common in the days of Abraham. Early in the mor morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, because you're up in the Exodus now, and realize they're not going to be doing this like they did in the times of the past. Okay? Perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. Job 42, verse 16. After this, Job lived 140 years. So we had the time period before this happened when he was able to have 10 children and all of the financial things. And they, in those days, the financial was based on how many head of oxen you had, how many servants and so forth back in Abraham's day. So that would put Job to be roughly 180 years old, give or take. About Abraham's age that he lived. So we're putting all this into those time frames. Why would Job not be historical? Because it's written in poetry? Hmm, maybe that's why. Genesis 25, 7 says, Abraham lived 175 years. So we got the same time frame as Job. Genesis twenty-two nineteen 19 to 21 says, Abraham went back to his servants, and they got up and set out together for Beersheba. And Abraham settled in Beersheba. Sometime later, Abraham was told, Milcah has also born sons to your brother Nahor. Uz, where was Job from in the first of Job? Uz, he was from the land of Uz. Uz the firstborn, which would be where the land is called because the firstborn son would inherit it. His brother Buzz, uh, Job, we're going to find out in a minute, was, his son was a Buzzite. Hmm. Job 1.1 1, 1 said, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. Job 32 Verses 1 to 2 says, So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. This kindled the anger of Elihu. Everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fails. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. Your will above all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise. Can you see that in the church at Colossae? Can you see that in the days where Moses came down and burned with anger because the people were sacrificing to a golden calf? How could Aaron have done this? Why did Aaron not get punished? You should have thought that when you were reading. God consecrated him and made him holy. Did God know this? Well, yeah, of course he did. We already talked about that in Job. And he still used him because of how big a God he is. Not because of how little God He is, and He didn't know this would happen. He used it for how big a God He is to show the people that He is a God of mercy as well as a God of justice. And you and I ought to be thanking Him right now for His mercy because we are just as guilty as Aaron. And we wonder why there's calamities and things in this world. How could a loving God let suffering go on like this? Because we're a fallen creation who turned from our God and continues to be stiff-necked and not worship Him. So when you read that, you say, wow, let's look at the mercy of God. That He would spare Aaron, and Aaron would learn from this and be the priest. 
Yet we are priests to this world now. The Holy Spirit lives and resides inside of us just as it did in Aaron. May we need to get some blood and remind us by wiping it all over us. But we are sealed by the Spirit of God to live a life of praise and honor. But you've got to let Him transform you from the inside out. I choose that word transform because it reminds me of Romans 12, 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, we wouldn't understand these sacrifices without reading about all this. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. That transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Something totally, radically changed. Something that is free to fly. Something that brings life to its children. That looks like death is occurring by dying, we actually live. That's the word that's used. If you look at the NLT, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all He has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Sounds just like the time of Moses, doesn't it? But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And now from the contemporary English version, we'll see if you like that one. Dear friends, God is good. So I beg you to offer your bodies to Him as a living sacrifice, pure and pleasing. That's the most sensible way to serve God. Don't be like the people of this world. Don't let God change the way, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to Him. Are you a born-again child of God? Are you living a life that pleases Him? Are you letting the Spirit change you from the inside out? You are a created being with a purpose. Anything that you create, you expect that creation to do what you have created it for. The difference is you have free will to say, not my will, but thine. The choice is up to you. Love. Something the world thinks is conditional. Something the world does not look at 1 Corinthians that way and say that, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Sherry took this off our bathroom wall this week. It's a little pretty black, excuse me, with two wedding bands and some hearts. And she said, you know, the world wants to tell me that this is love between a husband and wife. But I do realize, I've said it plenty of times, I say it over and over, but God's Word says it too. Paul says it clearly in his letter. This is how Christians are to love one another. This has nothing to do with your marriage. Your marriage should, should portray this definitely. But this is the love that I'm supposed to have for each one of you and you're supposed to have back for me. Not keeping records of wrong, not boastful, not selfish, but selfless. Why? Because that is exactly what God did for us. Praise be to God that those are His characteristics. That He is long-suffering and patient with us. That He is kind to us when we deserve the opposite of that. That He keeps no records of wrongs when we believe in Jesus Christ. That our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. And that's what Paul is writing, telling them that this is the most excellent way. If you remember how those verses started out in chapter 13, after he said in chapter 12, let me show the most, you the most excellent way. He says, if you speak in angelic tongues or in tongues of men, 
but don't have love, you'll be nothing but a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If you have all prophecy and wisdom and everything, but don't have love, you are nothing. You don't even exist. And if you give everything that you have and sell it so that give it away to the poor, and you even abuse or burn your body as a martyr, what good is that? You've gained nothing. You leave this world spiritually bankrupt. But because of God's love, because He is patient and kind and long-suffering, He says, you're not noise. I hear you. He says, you're not nothing. You're everything to me. I sent my son to die for you. And if you believe in Him, you're not spiritually bankrupt. In fact, I've given you my spirit to give you life. That's the most excellent way. Now love one another. Love never fails. Oh, I'm so thankful that the love that Paul writes about is what God's love is for me. That He does have mercy. It's perfectly seasoned with justice. Scripture tells us that we're supposed to live as Jesus lives. Something that I cannot do unless God loves me enough to dwell inside of me so that I can take on the office of a priest. That we can take on that office together as a royal priesthood. So that we can be patient, kind, never jealous, never boastful, not proud or rude, not selfish, not quick-tempered, not keeping records of any wrongs that others do to us, but instead rejoicing in the truth, not in evil, always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting, letting love never fail to do its job. The bulletin, you see, I put that in there in different words probably than what I just said right there. To remind us so that we can allow the Spirit to increase our faith and increase our love for one another. So now I'm going to read Colossians 1.11 one more time. Maybe you'll pick up something that you didn't pick up before. From Paul, chosen by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from Timothy, who is also a follower, to God's people who live in Colossae and are faithful followers of Christ, I pray that God our Father will be kind to you and will bless you with peace. Each time we pray for you, we thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have heard of your faith and of your love for all of God's people because what you hope for is kept safe for you in heaven. You first heard about this hope when you believed the true message, which is the good news. Verse 6. Now this good news is spreading all over the world with great success. I don't know about you, but that's what I want for my family, for my friends, for this community, for our world. It is spread in the same way among you. Ever since the first day you learned the truth about God's wonderful kindness from our good friend Epaphras. He works together with us for Christ and is a faithful worker for you. He is also the one who told us about the love that God's Spirit has given you. We have not stopped praying for you since the first day we heard about you. In fact, we always pray that God will show you everything that He wants to do and that you may have all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives you. Then you will live a life that honors God, and you will always please Him by doing good deeds. I will, you will come to know God even better. His glorious power will make you patient and strong enough to endure anything, and you'll be truly happy. I'll read one more section of Scripture, and I'll close us with prayer. This is from Romans 12. Again, I'm just going to go further than what I read before in the contemporary English version. Starting in verse 1. Dear friends, God is good, so I beg you to offer your bodies to Him as a living sacrifice, pure and pleasing. That's the most sensible way to serve God. Don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to Him. Realize God has treated me, I realize that God has treated me with undeserved grace. So I tell each of you not to think that you are better than you really are. Use good sense and measure yourself by the amount of faith that God has given you. A body is made up of many parts, 
and each of them has its own use. That's how it is with us. There are many of us, but we are each but we each are part of the body of Christ, as well as part of one another. God has also given each of us different gifts to use. If we can prophesy, we should do it according to the amount of faith we have. If we can serve others, we should serve. If we can teach, we should teach. If we can encourage others, we should encourage them. If we can give, we should give generously. If we are, if we are leaders, we should do our best. If we are good to others, we should do it cheerfully. Be sincere in your love for others. Hate everything that is evil and hold tightly to everything that is good. Love each other as brothers and sisters and honor others more than you do yourself. Never give up. Eagerly follow the Holy Spirit and serve the Lord. Let your hope make you glad. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your spirit that seals us, that empowers us, that comforts us, that guides us, that teaches us, and so many more things. Open up our minds to change our hearts, to live a life of worth for you. You, God, are God alone. You deserve all praise and honor. May we seek after your will rather than our, others, than our own. May we spur one another on to good works. May we be a church that is known for its faith and its loving deeds for one another and for this world. May we make a difference and draw people to you. May we be with Jesus instead of against Jesus. May we be harvesting instead of scattering. I thank you and praise you for each one that's here, Father. And I pray that your words will not come back void. I just thank you and praise you for this church. And I give you all glory and honor. Your will be done and your kingdom come. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs>